I am Jacqueline. I'm one of the associate directors for the Office of Admissions. Um, I've been with UCCS for 11 years, and I started out doing transfer credit, um, doing a lot of transfer coursework with our admissions office. Um, so students who start at Pikes Peak Community College and come over to UCCS or any of the other Colorado community colleges. Um, and then um, I've stayed with the office so long they let me do other things now too. Um, but I really enjoy connecting with students, um, helping you understand if we might be the right place for you to come and get a degree, um, and just identifying that fit. So when you think about picking out a college, it's a lot about fit and feel and making sure um, you're at the right size campus and that we have the degree programs that you want. Um, so hopefully you ask me questions as we go. I do have a question. Oh, yeah, perfect. It's in reference to the dual enrollment that high schoolers can get to get their associates. Is that something just to, so I, I just need to know more information about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I will touch on that with some academics. So thank you for, for asking about that, and I will touch on some of that. It's a great question. Perfect. Cool. All right. I like that small group. So yeah, don't wait. If you have a burning question. Go ahead and like, let's put it out there. Um, so we are a part of the University of Colorado system. So um, the University of Colorado system includes uh, the Boulder campus, University of Colorado Denver, the Anschutz Medical Campus, and then us here in Colorado Springs. Even though we're all part of the same system and you get a University of Colorado degree, our majors and programs we offer are different and the degree program requirements are different. Um, if you tour any of those other campuses, you'll also notice that our campuses feel really different. So coming back to that fit and feel piece. Um, so Boulders definitely have more of that Boulder college town feel. You all are in Colorado Springs, so you kind of know how Colorado Springs feels. But as far as campus size go, goes, we're kind of a small to medium sized campus. So uh, we have uh, just under 10,000 undergraduate students here on campus, and we bring in about 1,800 freshmen a year. So just to kind of give you that size comparison. And what's really awesome is that we're in one of our lecture halls today. So you're kind of getting a feel for um, what some of our classrooms spaces feel like. All right, so oh, nice photo. All right, so academics, um, to touch on some of that. So um, we offer a wide variety of degrees and programs, but it's, it's that's the most helpful thing is if you do know you have some specific academic interests, making sure that the college or university you're looking at can um, meet those interests. Um, so when we start talking about um, like dual enrollment credits and things like that. Like, let's say you were interested in a degree in civil engineering. I would not advise you to start with UCCS because there's not a lot of coursework you can transfer to another school for civil engineering specifically. Um, but uh, when it comes to the Colorado Community College system, we actually have full course guides you can follow to work on earning an associate degree um, that would transfer, take care of your first 60 credit hours of a degree. So a degree is, a bachelor's degree is 120 credit hours. And so um, the community college, when you work on an associate degree, you can do the first 60 credit hours of that. There are some specific programs that that, that doesn't work as well with. So when I'm thinking about that, so, just as some examples, uh, this is actually um, a picture of a lab for engineering. Uh, so it's a materials lab where students start learning about um, different types of materials they might um, be suggesting you use for an engineering uh, project. If you don't understand how materials work, it's kind of hard to start thinking about how you would build something with different types of materials. So um, how do they withstand different types of pressure and things like that. But um, engineering, as an example, when we start talking about transfer credits, there's um, sometimes a little bit less you can do at a community college for that. So um, there are a few mechanical engineering classes at the community college that can be done, um, but uh, computer science has a full 60 credit hours of coursework that can be done. So as far as engineering, we have engineering programs. So we have computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical. Anyone interested in them? Anyone thinking engineering? Okay, do you know what type of engineering? Yeah, uh, computer science. Computer science, okay, yep. And with computer science, this gets even crazier. We offer, um, so we offer a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Science, and a Bachelor of Innovation in computer science. So um, just to explain kind of what that is and what that means a little bit, um, the difference between a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science, think of the S on a Bachelor of Science as having more math, more science requirements. 
So Bachelor of Science in Computer Science requires Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, uh, linear equations, differential, or sorry, differential equations and lots of math, um, whereas the Bachelor of Arts requires less math. Um, the Bachelor of Innovation, that is unique to UCCS. So um, we have a trademark for Bachelor of Innovation. You won't see that at other colleges or universities. We offer it for very specific degrees. You can do a Bachelor of Innovation in Business, Computer Science. Um, we have a Game Design and Development Program in Engineering. You can do it in Early Childhood Education, Chemistry. But a Bachelor of Innovation um, is a program where students take 24 credit hours of innovation and entrepreneurship as a part of their degree. Um, and those are really, I get really excited. That's like a really helpful, anytime you can bring an entrepreneurial mindset to the work you're doing, I think it's so helpful because you're starting to think about how can I make this better? How can I um, do something new and exciting with uh, whatever you're working with, whatever uh, products? Students do group projects um, in those 24 credit hours where they have a real deliverable for a company or an organization in town. And they're already building their resume because they can put those things on there when they have those um, deliverables. I also really like that Bachelor of Innovation piece um, because they work with students from other academic majors. A lot of times once you get going, um, if you're a business student, you're going to do all of your group projects with other business students. But with this Bachelor of Innovation, you'd be working with business students, engineering students, chemistry, um, early childhood education. And what you're doing is learning how to leverage each other's skill sets. So um, that's just a little bit about our Bachelor of Innovation. I think it's a really neat program to be considering. Um, just really quickly, like what other majors are people interested in? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes, yeah, so um, you're, maybe you're thinking, what is West? Um, it's the direction, it's where the mountains are. Um, it is the Women's uh, and Ethnic Studies uh, program. Uh, so with our West degree, students can actually combine that with a sociology degree. We have some different options for that. You can do West as a minor, so um, that's a helpful skill set um, in any major as well. Um, I'm thinking about working with um, different populations. Anyone interested in nursing? Yes, okay. So um, so a couple interested in nursing. A couple of things to about, know about nursing is that um, with nursing, you apply to UCCS and you get admitted. You take um, prerequisites to then apply for a clinical program. You're shaking, you already know, cool, awesome. Um, you take the prerequisite classes and then you apply for a clinical spot. So nursing clinical seats are competitive entry. It's based on how you do on the T's exam and then your overall college GPA. Um, that T's exam tests on those prerequisite courses like chemistry and anatomy and physiology. Um, so uh, with our nursing program, we have a simulation lab that's super cool. You won't see that today, um, but there are videos on YouTube that you can find um, where they show the inside. But the simulation lab has like mannequins that can simulate childbirth and they can cry and they can, you can start getting that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we have a visit day on campus, um, and uh, that's coming up. It's, we do our visit days um, that are themed by major on Fridays, and so we do have a nursing-specific visit day where we actually take students into those simulation labs if you want to see those. Um, it's called Mountain Lion Visit Day, so if you're on the UCCS website and you look up Mountain Lion Visit Day, you'll find that. Um, but it's pretty cool, like the nursing students get really excited and the rest of us have that same, oh, reaction where <laughs> we don't think we want to do that. But um, yeah, that's a little bit so. And then so you have that kind of simulation lab experience and then you get out and you start doing your clinicals where you're actually working with people. So um, lots of opportunities for um, feedback and coaching in that simulation lab. Um, other majors? Yes. You guys have a technology <laughs> certificate program, but no bachelor's degree in technology? Yeah, so that's like more of a, so there is um, undergraduate coursework you can be doing for gerontology. So. Um, and that's, yes, there's a PhD option in that. So that's definitely an area. Um, typically students might do an undergrad in psychology um, and connect through the, the geropsychology there. Um, I had a student worker in my office who did the geropsychology as a minor um, and it was fun talking with her because she was actually really interested in um, making prosthetics. 
um, which I was like, wow, when I was your age in college, I never would have thought about like a career in making prosthetics, but she really wanted to understand like how elder pe elderly people, um, how they worked, um, understanding how to work with the population, what kinds of different needs they might have. So yes, that's an option as well. Yep. Yes. Secondary education through possible literature. Yeah, so um, well, secondary education, you could do like secondary education in English would be the option area. Um, so with UCCS, you're getting your degree for secondary education, specifically your degree in English, so that secondary education components that are already used to teach at the end of your four years. Yeah. Um, so I see biomedical under the health sciences yeah. category, but not that there's not biomedical engineering. We do not have biomedical engineering. Yeah. But you are in the best building for biomedical, so hopefully you guys are going to walk around this building too. I, I will tell you the cadavers are here. Some people get really excited about that. Some people are not as excited to hear that. If you don't know, the cadavers are the bodies that they are cutting open to study. Um, but it's very cool. So if you're interested in, in human physiology and nutrition or um, biomedical sciences, you're in the right place. So, which actually kind of highlights this. So one of the things when you get to college, the ways you can kind of add on to your experiences are by doing internships, um, by doing research with faculty. So. Um, just to kind of give you, so you're in this room and you might think, are all my classes going to be in a room this big? Um, no, they're not. Our average class size is 25. Um, I bet that's smaller than some of the classes you've been in in your schools. Okay. Some of your classes are bigger than 25. So that's um, a little bit, you'll, we have some of these. Our biggest lecture hall on campus holds 298. That's the biggest one. The types of classes that are in there are like our, um, if you have to take general chemistry, a lot of students need general, general chemistry. So the lectures in a bigger lecture hall, but then you're in a lab class, which is much smaller, and that's where you can get definitely some more one-on-one -on -one interaction. So coming back to kind of adding on to your experience, some degree programs require internships. So we offer a sport management degree in our College of Business. Um, with education, you're going to get your hands-on experience in the classroom doing some teaching and, and things like that. Um, and then our criminal justice degree also requires students to do an internship. So if there is a required internship, hands-on experience required, we're going to have faculty and um, department people that are going to help you with um, making sure you get that requirement completed. Um, being on a campus this size, there's a lot of opportunity to get involved in research, um, getting published with faculty, presenting at conferences. There are research opportunities at larger institutions as well, um, but typically you might be working with a graduate student and not working directly with the faculty member. Um, so I had a student that was doing research with a faculty member. She was in the computer science department. She got published with the faculty member and she did go and present at a conference. Um, and she's now at Notre Dame working on her PhD and her faculty member was so supportive of helping her get to that goal. So those are the kinds of opportunities we want our students to take advantage of. Um, education abroad is something else that you can do at UCCS. So um, that would be studying outside of the country. Maybe you're thinking, I am not ready to commit to four months. That's a full semester, 16 weeks of being in another country. Um, or maybe you're like, I am absolutely ready to do that. Um, we have, the reason I say maybe you're not ready for that is that we do have some faculty-led trips. Sometimes those are shorter trips, so they might just be um, over a winter break or a spring break or something like that, but it's traveling with other UCCS students. Whereas when we think about that full semester abroad experience, a lot of times that's um, one, a student kind of going somewhere, a particular country they're interested in. I had Emma, who was a student employee in my office, she's a philosophy major. She wanted to do some language acquisition for French, so she did have some French, and she spent a semester in France um, doing language acquisition, living with host families. Um, so those are the kinds of experiences that you can build into, into your years in college. It takes a lot of planning. If you are interested in that, um, the more you let people know that that's your goal, the more we can help you help connect you because when you're working on your coursework, we want to make sure that whatever you're doing when you come back applies to your degree. Um, so you'll have an academic advisor that'll help you um, and you can uh, work with our education abroad office to explore those opportunities and discuss funding these opportunities. So when you get to college, 
I just want to confirm we don't read minds here. So the more you tell us about these are the majors and programs I'm interested in, I want to have this experience, the more we can help you with seeking those out. Yes. So for study abroad programs, is that already with the standard tuition or is it above and beyond the tuition? It's going to be above and beyond the tuition. Yeah. Great question. So yeah, there is um, different programs and depending on where you want to go study, those are all going to cost different amounts and, and typically beyond what the tuition rate here is with and you'd be paying the program you're going to. Um, one opportunity that I want to also mention is there's something called the National Student Exchange, and that's where students have the opportunity to go to another college or university in the United States and um, study there, but they pay the UCCS tuition rate. You do have to go through an application process with that, um, and just you can't just go to any school. They have certain uh, schools that are partners. Um, but I had a student worker, Liam Peter, who um, we got to talking, and um, he was telling me how much he wanted to go. Um, some of his goals were living in another state, and he always has uh, New York sweatshirts on. I'm like, you know, did you know we have this program? Um, and so he started looking into it, um, and he was looking at. He ended up actually looking at northern areas. And, Northern Arizona University and then a school in New Orleans. So um, that's an opportunity where you're paying the UCCS tuition rate and, and getting a different experience. So I also encourage students to think about that. Um, and especially if you're like, I've never left Colorado and the idea of doing that is scary, start out doing the National Student Exchange. Yes. Is that program based like a semester or you can go like the four years? That would be like typically a semester. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a master's in uh, international foreign relations? Um, so I specialize in undergraduate programs. Um, I don't know. I probably like something in college of business with international stuff would be close to that, but I don't. I don't think we have that specifically. Yeah. All right. Yes. Dee, how strong is your campus ministry program for people who are very religious? Yeah. I so noticed that the Newman Center is not on UCCF campus. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So there are different clubs and organizations that are religious affiliated, um, and it kind of just um, so clubs are really uh, an opportunity for our students. They build that culture. Um, but yes, I have students that are connected to the uh, the members that, that work in our office on campus. So um, our, our Catholic community is pretty strong. So there's all types of opportunities. And if we don't have a club that you want, it only takes you and three friends to start a club. Um, and so a lot of times clubs are where we start seeing religious, um, the, the religious affiliated groups. Yes. As far as, so I have an older daughter. She's um, looking at college, planning to go into criminal justice forensics. She wants to do online. She's also working full time. How does your online program work? Is it specific lectures at specific times? Or is it, I don't know the right word. Yeah, yeah, there's a secret of ignorance. There's yes. like a million ways, but yeah. So um, when we start talking about online classes, that's going to depend on the particular course. It's, so some classes will be, you have to get, if it's an online class, you have to get on at this time um, and do it. And some of them are going to be like, you do it at the time that works for you. So when you see an online degree program at UCCS, it will, like, within that program, that will change by class. So. Great question, yeah. And not all of our degrees and programs are offered online. So like, you can do a fully online degree in criminal justice, um, philosophy, communication, um, but engineering is not online. That is in person, on campus, weekdays, during the daytime. So, cool. Great question, thank you. All right, so you might have noticed when you were driving in the End Center for the Arts, that's actually over across the street. Um, so the End Center for the Arts houses are theater, dance, um, and music majors. Um, if you're, maybe you're like, yes, I want to perform on the side or I want to major in one of those areas. This is a really great building. Or maybe you just want to see some world-class performances. So they bring in a variety of different groups that you can go and check out. Um, and it's a really amazing facility. All right, so a little bit about student life. So um, part of your experience in college is the academics and the degree you're working on. Um, and uh, I, we talked, I touched a little bit about transfer credit. Um, the biggest thing with transfer, if you're bringing in AP, we do um, a lot of the AP scores 
Um, you need fours or fives, um, some of the threes as well. Um, if you type in AP on our website, is anyone doing AP coursework or? Okay, I'll bypass AP. Any IB? No. Okay, so just concurrent, like concurrent enrollment are starting off at a community college. If you are doing that, we have a transfer website specifically where those course guides are that you can follow. But basically, people like me are here to help you, and that's what we want to do. So if you're looking at starting off at a community college first, um, connect with us so that we can be kind of um, talking to you specifically about your academic goals and kind of connecting you to the degree plans and helping with course recommendations. Our goal is always to help our students save time and money. So um, yes, attending a Colorado community college is uh, tuition, the tuition rate is cheaper. You cannot sudden, you can't do your first two years at UCCS and say, oh, I really wish I had saved some money and started community college. I'll go there now um, because community college only have what we call our lower division credit hours. It's the first two years of the degree. So if you, if saving money is like of top priority to you, you need to be thinking about doing that in your first two years of college. Um, and we can work with you on that. So, all right, so a little bit about student life. Um, so just, I was just okay. to point out, if you take concurrent credits, you don't necessarily have to go to community college. You can go to a four year and yep. bring in those credits. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you were a high school student doing it, yes, you don't need to go to community college first. You can bring those like that. Um, and also, I do want to point out for our nursing students, Pikes Peak State College has a bachelor's in nursing um, as well. So they offer an associate degree in nursing, and you can do our RN to be a said there's. There's a lot of flavors. You want to, if you leave with nothing else today, leave with the fact that there's people like me that want to help you and like connect with us because we can tell you about all the little different things um, that are specific to your interests so that you can kind of figure out what's best for you. So you're not a state university? We are. Private. No, we're a public school. So we're part of the university. We're the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and we're a public school. But not a state university. So. Pikes Peak, it was Pikes Peak Community College. They're here locally in Com, and they just uh, rebranded to be Pikes Peak State College. But they are part of the Colorado Community College <coughs> system. And it kind so, of confused us to the university level and the college level. Yeah, so there's I, the best thing to keep in mind to help distinguish that would be that the, there's a Colorado Community College system, and there's uh, Colorado Community Colleges across the state of Colorado, um, and they you can, some they have different degrees programs as well. Um, and then the four year um, colleges and institutions would be um, like the other schools that aren't. So like there's Arapahoe Community College. Most of the time the community colleges say um, based on the area they're in. So there's the community college of Aurora. So the kind of the area they're in and they normally say community college, Pikes Peak just became Pikes Peak State College, and they do offer some bachelor, like they offer a few bachelor's degrees, like the nursing is the specific one. Um, but other than that, Pikes Peak, is, Pikes Peak is more of that community college that doesn't offer a wide breadth of four year degrees. Does that help? Okay, thank you. I thought the difference between a college and a university was that colleges don't have uh, master's programs, and that is the distinguishment between. Am I wrong in that? So, I, so <laughs> not all colleges do. A college should have some graduate programs, but university levels are distinguished by research and funding. And okay. higher the program is the best. Yeah, it's very confusing. When I started my undergrad degree, they were a college when I started, and they decided to switch their making from university while I was there. And I know they also felt like that would help them attract international students because it would globally help people talk about higher education, international universities, interpretable education, Any other questions? Okay, all right. So yeah, so um, clubs, um, there's lots of ways to get connected. So um, your academic experience is important in college along with your social connections and, and building those experiences up. So um, for our clubs, we have academic themed clubs. So um, there's honor societies that you can be a part of. We also have um, clubs that are just for fun. There's frozen yogurt club. They go around town and try all the frozen yogurt places. Um, but we have, there's a sandwich club that I know one of our student workers is a part of. Um, I have another student worker that's trying to start a lettuce club. So um, there's, he wants to see how fast everyone can eat a head of lettuce. 
Um, so if there's anything you want, it only takes you and three friends to start a club if we don't have it. Um, but it's a great way to meet other students that might share an interest with you. And we have a club fair each semester where clubs are out advertising on their opportunities. We have like a ski and uh, snowboarding club. So if you're wanting to do that, they normally stop at the hot springs on the way back to campus. Um, if you've never skied or snowboard, college is a great time to try new things. Um, they actually have people that will, um, that they'll help you get connected with the right equipment and things like that. We are division two for athletics. Um, so if anyone's thinking that they want to do a, a, if you're playing a sport now and you want to continue, um, you do have to uh, like get recruited to play a division two sport. Um, we have athletic scholarships that is based on the team needs and the coaches. So um, admissions office doesn't really handle that. You have, normally would fill out a prospect form um, or contact the coach to let them know about your interest. Um, basketball in particular is one of the harder sports. That can't, it's a small team. You don't need a lot of people on a court. So that's a little bit more competitive to get involved in. Whereas, um, you know, other teams like track and field, they carry a lot more students, um, sometimes a little bit more a little bit easier, but they are also a competitive team because they've been doing really well. So, um, but if you want to think about division two sports, um, that's great. If you don't want to do division two sports, we do have intramurals and um, club sports. Intramural sports is just playing other students on campus through the rec center. You don't need to have played it before. You can try a new sport. Um, I don't think any of you have probably played a canoe battleship in the swimming pool before? Anyone have experience in that? No, okay. Yeah, so you can, um, call it, college is when you try new things. Um, I think as a lot of students get nervous about trying new things, they think I need to know how to do this, or a, and um, really it's a, a community where um, we wanna connect you with the tools. You don't even need to know how to paddle. Um, but with the canoe battleship, they literally are dumping buckets of water in each other's boats, trying to sink them in the pool. So lots of fun. Um, we have our student outdoor leadership experience, our sole office. They're the ones that lead the trips. Like if you want to go skydiving, ice climbing, um, anything, any of those, uh, they do a, a Labor Day trip out to the sand dunes. Um, I had a student that years ago and um, she was coming from out of state and that's how she met a lot of students when she came to UCCS because Labor Day is the first three day weekend when you get going. And um, so they'll help you travel across the state of Colorado. There's typically extra fees for a lot of those activities. It's significantly cheaper than if you um, went out to go do those activities um, yourself. Um, the college is normally getting a reduced rate for that um, and some group rates with it. Um, something that's unique is our housing at UCCS and I'm gonna run out of time. Um, our housing is all suite style. So um, most colleges and universities have dormitories. That's where you um, would walk down the hall and there's you know 18 people that, um, you know, 18 girls sharing a girls bathroom or whatever. Um, with ours, our bathrooms are in our suites. So the most people you'd ever share a bathroom with is five other people, but it greatly causes the price of our housing. There's a pretty big range of housing price. So we have kind of $11,000 up to $15,000. What drives the cost of the housing up for you as a student is the more privacy you get and the bigger your room gets, it's gonna be more expensive. So our introverts deluxe package where you have your own bedroom, your own bathroom, that's gonna be that $15,000 most expensive option. Um, so in our suites, we have options where you can, um, like right here, you can see it's your own room within the suite. Um, we also have shared rooms within the suite. So it could be a four person suite where there's two people in each room. That's gonna be a cheaper option. All of our housing prices are on our website. So you can see that breakdown, but that's uh, the difference between dorms and suite style living. So all of our housing is suite style. And that's a lot of students really like that about our campus. <laughs> Um, support services are another really important thing. I'm about down to one minute. Um, again, walk away with nothing else. Just know that there's a lot of people on this campus that want to help you and we cannot read your mind. We have two free tutoring centers. So, so math, writing, or, or multi-literacy. So math, multi-literacy science, um, language center. Um, if you want to do uh, like foreign language or you've been taking foreign language, we have conversation tables in there. So if you want to just keep up on a foreign language, you can do that. If you're really good at one of those content areas, you can be paid to be a tutor in one of those um, tutoring centers. So um, all of our students take a gateway program seminar course. It's a freshman class to kind of help you transition to campus and get started. 
Um, and they're taught in fun themed topic areas. Some are themed by major um, and they vary by uh, faculty and staff interest areas. We've had fantasy football, we've had poker themed ones, we have undecided majors, we have one called head of the class for our education majors. Um, so those are a great way to connect with other students. Uh, we have coffee. This is one of our support services. I'm just kidding. Coffee is not a support service. Um, this is highlighting our in-campus student jobs. We hire a lot of students on our campus. We own all of our own food services. So you can work in the dining halls. You can work in catering. I always mention that because normally you get free food when you do that. And when you get to college, free food is where it's at. Um, but you, we hire students in our admissions office. If you want to go out and give campus tours, if you want to... Um, uh, help do presentations for school groups. We let some of our students do that as well. So um, you can write parking tickets on our campus. You can work in the library. You can work in financial aid. Pretty much we have students everywhere. You can work in grounds maintenance, learn how to run a sprinkler system. That's a life skill if you become a homeowner, learn how to fix that. So transferable skills. This is our rec center. Um, so we have a pool, we have a slide, a 22 person hot tub. We have a rock climbing wall. Again, if you don't know how to rock climb and you wanna learn how to do that, come learn how to do that. Like there are people that are excited to show you and teach you how to rock climb. If you wanna learn how to belay, come learn how to belay. It's awesome. We have lots of services through our health center. Um, our, you can get a massage, you can see a chiropractor. Those are all extra costs. Um, that's where um, you can get prescriptions if you get sick, things like that. We have counseling services. So um, lots of support. A little bit about cost. This is the Colorado tuition and fees. So that 12,000 is for 30 credit hours. That's for a year of tuition. Um, our co your cost is based on how many credit hours you're taking. Um, I think it's just nice to see just general college awareness. If you start looking out of state, you're gonna see the costs go up. Um, your state income taxes that your family is paying is why it's cheaper to be an in-state resident and attend UCCS. Um, there's the Western Undergraduate Exchange Program called WUI. That's uh, where there's some reciprocity agreements between uh, different states for reduced tuition rate. It's 150%. That's what a student from California or Washington, all the way down to Arizona, New Mexico, they get the WUI tuition rate when they come to UCCS. So just a little bit about that. All right, I think I'm gonna end there unless there's any other burning <laughs> questions. But I know that was a lot. Yes. Do you have a business card or something? I will <laughs> give you my information before I leave. Yeah. All right. Oh, yes. Could you tell me briefly about the visual art program? Yeah. So um, visual arts is part of our visual arts and perform visual performing arts degrees. So um, there are options um, and to do like coursework. Um, do you have a particular area in visual arts that you're interested in? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, that's going to include like your photography, um, drawing, things like that. Um, and we can definitely, um, there's, it kind of, it's, you have a lot of opportunity to kind of focus in areas you want, but it is a little bit also of a well-rounded degree where you can't just kind of 100% go into one thing. But yeah, we have like the drawing that's part of our visual performing arts department. And we have a visit day for that as well. Um, so that those not mine visit days, they will um, have that will be at the end center for the arts where they'll hit on all of their um, all the departments within visual performance. All right, cool. Thank you. I'll get you my information. <laughs> All right, thank you for your presentation from the admissions office. I am pleased to speak to you this morning to have the opportunity to introduce our guest speakers, Dr. Stephen Pitts in Alexandria Joslich, Dr. Pitts holds a PhD in political philosophy and international relations from the University of Texas at Austin. He is currently the executive director of the Center for the Study of Government and the Individual and is an associate professor at UCCS. His research focuses on political liberalism and current challenges to the liberal order. He has also written several books on political theory and international politics. Alexandria Daslick 
is the Director of Outreach for the Study of the Center of Government and the Individual at UCCS. And she also uh, holds a BA in Political Science and has experience working in the Atten Attorney General's Office. She was the Chief Lobbyist for the Restaurant Industry in Nevada during the pandemic and successfully passed legislation that helps them survive during that time. We are extremely excited to have Dr. Pitts and Alexandria provide us their expertise on the topics of voting, local government, and the history of political thought. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Pitts and Alexandria Dazlick. Thank you very much, and thank you for having us here. I will uh, introduce Alexandria after I'm done with my little spiel here. But um, so I am a professor in the political science department, but I'm mostly here in my capacity as a director of the Center for Study of Government and the Individual. And I want to talk a little bit about that, um, and then how Aaron Jones fits into that before mm -hmm. giving you a little overview of what I'll say the, the meaning of voting is, or one way we might think about voting. Um, but so the Center for Study of Government and the Individual is one of many centers on campus. So you'll see this all over UCCS or any other of the, of the CU campuses. There's centers that are basically set up to provide extra programming in particular issues, right? So we have, for example, the Heller Center of the Arts and Sciences, which likes to host artists and, and plays and, and music performances. We have something called the Center for Human Resiliency which focuses just on that, on um, basically, actually it's not an area of expertise, but they talk about different ways of humans can be resilient and in psychology departments. Um, and usually centers are set up to do extra programming in areas that maybe you wouldn't be getting quite as much in the normal classes, right? Um, and they're usually privately funded as well, this is external funding, so it's, it's people out there in the community that have uh, a lot of interest and passion for these issues, and they want to they want to create more programming about it. So we're one of those centers, Center for Study of Government and the Individual, and so as you can see, it focuses on politics and political science, but it really focuses too on understanding liberalism and liberal democracy, both in America but elsewhere as well. Okay, and. Um, the idea of a center of government and the individual is that the individual is very important. We sort of take this for granted uh, in America that the individual is sort of the basis of politics. We're all citizens, we all have rights, we all have dignity. That's not actually um, the historical norm by the way, right? Um, this, this is, we're used to it and we're blessed to have it, but if you look throughout human history, it's not, it's not the norm, it's closer to the exception. So we do a lot of programming around these issues. Um, and we also talk now, nowadays we're talking more about civics as well. Understanding what it means to be an American citizen, understanding how the American government is set up, understanding what rights and obligations you have as American citizens. Um, so we've, we've been doing that as well. I mean, we have programming that, that we do a speaker series. We always bring in speakers um, and do sort of big community events. We do, um, seminars with high school teachers, teaching them about different issues that pertain to this. Uh, my favorite thing is that we have an honors program for political science and economics majors. So if anyone wants to do political science or e economics, um, and we might even bring some philosophy majors into this as well, uh, that's something to look forward to. It's, it's a great way not only to, to earn a little money, but also to, to get with some like-minded um, students and, and, and work out some of these these problems or learn more about these issues. So how does Parents Challenge do this? Well, about a year ago, um, we started talking to Parents Challenge, Challenge folks who are interested in somehow extending Parents Challenge support into right, the university, right, right, into your time at the university. And they approached us at Center for the Study of Government uh, and Individual and said, well, maybe we could do some kind of honor program for the Parents Challenge students. So that's what we started to do. We had our first cohort last year, and we have another one going this semester. And it's very, very informal in, in one sense. I usually meet these students for lunch. We might read something short and, and, and talk about it. Um, but then, of course, you're also getting your other parents' 
general benefits. Um, you know, I'm not too shy to say a nice check that you get. Uh, you know, through through your your college years as well. So that's where we fit in with parents' challenge. Um, we're we'll, welcome to answer any questions about that. And we're still sort of figuring this thing out. I mean, we're learning as we go as we build this program. But it is something that if you do come to UCCS, we'd love to to connect with you and see if uh, see if you see if you can can join us uh, to do that. Okay. So what we're supposed to talk about voting today, which I think is a little unfair to have to follow Jacqueline, who's kind of showing you, you know, whatever, the really cool rec center and the climbing wall and all the, all the fun things to do. And now we can pick one of the most boring topics you might think of, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I'll do my best. So we do the usual question, show of hands. Uh, how many of you have heard or in the general sense, like, look, your vote doesn't matter anyway. It's a huge country and like your vote's never gonna change. But how many of you kind of heard that or felt that? All right, and you know what? Statistically speaking, you're right, right? Statisticians will, will tell you, especially when it comes to a national election, election obviously for a president, even for a senator, uh, you're, uh, you're likely, the, 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 the chances of your vote mattering in terms of switching the outcome is, is significantly less than winning the town hall lottery, right? Which maybe makes you want to go buy a lot of these tickets, I don't know. But, um, but anyways, it's a very, very small chance. Now, I will say that's not true of more local elections, which is a very, very important thing to think about. But in any case, it kind of makes you, know, makes you a little less motivated to go vote. Um, but then, you know, we still have people going to vote and we see the little I voted stickers, right? We see that all the time. Is it really sticker worthy? I mean, all they did was kind of go down the, the paper, maybe put an X in or pop a little piece of paper out. I mean, this doesn't seem sticker worthy to me. My five-year-old gets stickers, but they usually do more than that to actually earn the sticker. Um, but why that pride? Why does it matter? Well, here's one way to think about voting uh, that I think is important. And I don't want to actually dissuade you from, from voting and thinking that your vote matters. Because again, in lots of ways it can, and local elections are very well can. But it's more about understanding what voting as a practice means for who we are as citizens. And citizens, not subjects. We're not political subjects, we're political citizens. So I hopefully I won't take too long to do this, but I'm gonna try to just give a, like the, the, the quickest snapshot of political theory over the past three and a half years. Um, and maybe try to put voting into this context. So the big thing about <clears throat> governance is that what we're basically doing is setting some people up, some people up above others. And those people can tell the people underneath what to do. We don't like to think about that. We're in a democracy. But we do give authority to certain citizens to actually decide some things and actually tell their citizens what to do. Obviously, the federal government can tell you how much money you have to pay them in taxes, right? Or whether you can travel to another country because maybe there's some travel restrictions. They can affect your freedom to do certain things, right? So we're in a situation in all governance, in all human history, where some people have more authority than others. They have authority to tell other people what to do. The question is, how can that be justified? I mean, you might, you might say, okay, well maybe we should just get rid of that altogether. Nobody ever has any more authority than anybody else. That's proven to be pretty chaotic, right? It's proven to be pretty dangerous. It doesn't work very well. So we're in a situation where we have to have some people who are in charge, but we also have to justify their, their authority, their ability to be in charge. And there aren't that many ways to do this, but many ways have happened over human history. I'll kind of give, I mean, it's not exactly true, but I'll give you a nice story to think about this. So go back 3,000 years. How are people in charge justified in being in charge? How do they get that authority? More or less purely through strength or power. The people who are in charge were the more powerful people. Physically, mentally, economically, maybe financially. And the weak had to sort of suffer what they must, the powerful settlers. Okay? And that's still the case in many parts of the world today. It's, it's been with us throughout human history. So one justification is simply just power. I'll go back to the ancient Greeks and Romans. So, you know, scoot up 500 to 1,000 years, depending on where we are. Uh, what, what exactly? what country we're talking about, they start to think about this as well. Okay, well, how do we justify authority 
they were they were more or less uh, set up aristocratic republics. So there's aristocracy and democracy. What's the difference? Democracy is ruled by the people. Aristocracy, aristocracy is ruled by the best. Ruled by the best. Ruled by the most virtuous or most excellent. All right, and you might say, oh, that doesn't sound good. When we're Democrats, we don't like that feeling of saying that somebody's just better so they get to rule. They were more comfortable with it. But we can at least give them something here. I mean, if you play basketball with LeBron James and you're on the team with LeBron James, it's natural that you're going to look up to him and he's going to sort of dictate the play and say what to do. You're not going to say, uh, no, LeBron, uh, sorry, there's five seconds left, and I really kind of feel like taking the shot, right? But LeBron gets the shot. So what, if you think about it in terms of sports and some just being better, the team captain is usually better in some ways than the other um, players. That's sort of what they were doing. The rule by the best, the people who are in the best position to actually um, guide the society in the ways it needed to go, those are the people who should rule. A problem with that, of course, is it's hard to figure out who's the best. It's also hard to make sure who really is the best is in, is in power. And what happened, let's say, for the next 1,000 to 1,500 years is you get ruled by the best, but really they're not the best, right? They're ruling because they have a noble title, right? Like you've, seen, you've seen the movies, you've all watched some movies with right, ancient English, English kings and queens or French English kings and queens. There's nobility, there's royalty, right? And so you could be a very, very bad member of the royal family, but just because you have that special status, you're getting, right, you, you're, you're put in charge, you have that authority. That seems very arbitrary. It doesn't seem like something we can really get behind. But you also have things like the divine right of kings and monarchy, and also the rule of the churches, like the Holy Roman Empire, and the people who had power were like the popes and the cardinals and the bishops, and of course, the kings. All right, so all these people, and if you want to make the argument, at least just all reflect the best of us, and we all, um, uh, we all are happy to be under their tutelage. You know, that's, that's a tough argument to make. And as time went on, more and more corruption, more and more, uh, <clears throat> we might say, tyranny and oppression were apparent at time went on. Right? So now we're up to, let's say, the 17th century, right, the 1600s, and we start to get a new, um, a new attempt to justify political authority. We don't want this arbitrary royal authority anymore. We have to find a different way to. We still need to have rulers. We still need to have people in charge. We still have to have a mayor and a governor. Um, so something, something uh, began to stir really intellectual circles uh, called social contract theory. Has anybody heard of social contract theory? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. By the way, these are the types of things we'll talk about if you do the parents' challenge uh, with us. So it's interesting. You'll, you'll learn about social contract theory. Well, basically what happened is they said, all right, so we need to wrest power away. And this also coincided, I should say, historically, with the power of the church waning, way too many religious wars, and basically a lot of, a lot of powerful people said, we're not going to fight over religion anymore. We're not going to have Catholics and Protestants fighting for 100 years straight. We're not going to have uh, Christians and Muslims fighting. We're trying to get to some different kind of governance that's not, that's not uh, run by the church. And they said, okay, well, how can we justify political authorities? Basically what they're doing is trying to delegitimate or get rid of all this authority that's come before. But what comes up in its place? And this idea of a social contract was built over time over many thinkers. And the idea is basically this. If we have no government whatsoever, let's say everybody in this room, we were in an airplane and we landed on a deserted island and no one was there. So we're in what's called a state of nature. There's nothing, there's no rules really at all. How will we deal with that situation? The one way to deal with it, which happened a long time ago and still can happen now, is the strong people will just immediately start to take over. Maybe they take little plans, you know. Maybe I think I'm strong, I'd say, hey, anybody wants to do with me, let's go over into this little pineapple grove and we're gonna dominate it. And then we, maybe we'll start trying to, to, to you know, fight the rest of you guys later on as we do. The other way is that we all get together and agree that government is necessary, right? That's what the social contract is. 
The social contract is the agreement, whether it's actually signed or not is not the point. But the agreement amongst all equal citizens, right? So everyone's equal, equal citizens with equal rights and equal voice, all agree together that government is necessary. So we agree that we need some authority, but the way we make it legitimate is that we are the ones that, that actually agree to make it legitimate, right? It's, it comes through consensus. Doesn't mean that we get the person in authority that we want, right? Maybe you wanted Biden, maybe somebody else wanted Trump, but you agree that we're going to put people in authority, and we're gonna do it by choosing them. We're gonna do it by choosing them. So, what does that mean then for voting? Right, so I'm kind of switching gears here because I don't want to go too long. But what does that mean for voting? It means that every time we vote, we're actually participating in the social contract, if that makes sense. The social contract is this idea that we're all in this together, right? We're all <clears throat> in a situation where we know we need some rules, some authority, but we want that authority to be as free, as benevolent, as equal, as responsive to us as possible, right? As accountable to us as possible. Um, so that's that's what we're doing really every time we vote. We're reaffirming this idea that we can actually govern ourselves through a social contract rather than through these different arbitrary factors of strength, power, wealth, nobility, royalty. Right? Every time we vote, that's why I think that I voted sticker actually it is sticker worthy. Right? It is sticker-worthy because every time we do it, we're reaffirming that. We're reaffirming that commitment. So the more we think about that, the more we know about it, I think the better sense we'll have that what we're doing is worth it, right? That what we're doing is worth it. Um, any, any questions, comments? Yes? I'm kind of confused as to you. You emphasize individualism, mm -hmm. um, but yet, what I hear is promoting government. Mm -hmm. So where does libertarian and the phrase strong man come in? Yeah, it's a good question. So well, I wasn't going to say before you, uh, promoting individualism, but rather to say that individuals in liberal democracies are the units that make up the whole, right? So if you think about um, our liberal government, the individual, each individual citizen is sort of the fundamental unit of the whole, right? Which is of course different in some of these other regimes I'm talking about. Different authoritarian regimes, take, take, take China today. The Chinese Communist Party, they are the regime. Everybody else is a subject. And it's the group, it's actually a party-run system. The party is the most important unit in that local regime. Whereas in America, in other little months, the individual himself, the individuals have equal rights, they have equal dignity. Um, the second part of your question is so like libertarianism versus the whole. So, I mean, you know, and even, even most libertarians actually agree with the idea of the social contract. There are anarchists, there are anarchists out there, um, but most will agree in the need for the social contract. What they disagree on is how much power we actually have to give, give up the government. This is a very good question. When we engage in a social contract, we all are all agreeing to give some of our power up to these authorities, right? We're taking the authorities and we're saying, yes, we're going to give you this power to keep society stable, to set up some rules, set up a framework where we can all live under. But the, the word they disagree is how much power we give. Up. How many functions should the government perform? Right? That's where the that's where the disagreement. Let's go involved in, in decisions for people. Yeah. Which is we were supposed to be a republic, not a democracy. Yes, and that's okay. We could that's you're getting the more political theory, we are a constitutional republic, but still we're a democracy in the sense that the legitimation of power comes from the equal citizens that goes up. It flows up rather than down. Right. Yes. Any other questions? So in any case, if those are the kinds of uh, conversations you find interesting, uh, I do think, you know, consider doing the parents' channels and you come. If you like it that much, you might end up wanting to be a political science or an econ major. But in either, in either case, those options are available to you. Um, so, and, and I know that I gave you a very sort of theoretical uh, 30,000 foot view of why we might care about voting. Um, 
but Alexandria here is going to, she does a much better job than I do of giving you some more practical advice, practical information uh, that, that we might think about. I think it's a good question too. Oh yes. I have a question about the center, what is it, human resiliency? Yeah, the center on human resiliency, is that the same um, department that does the grid training? So I, I, I sometimes have a hard time here, I never have time here, that's who's sort over. Yes. The Center on Human Resiliency and UCCS. Mm -hmm. Is it the same group at UCCS who does the pure grit training? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And then do, do they look for, uh, are they looking for community members ever to be uh, study subjects? Like in experiments or something? Like in, in research well, studies? Well, well, I guess when I'm, not, I'm talking about more qualitative research, but if you're talking to a group of first responders, that'd be a group of people who I would see would be good people to talk to about resiliency. Uh, yeah, perhaps. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I don't have, we don't do that in the center in our department, or the center very much, but I think there's lots of things like that going on. Well, um, what kind of things do they have at the center for human resiliency? So what we do is all, is all pretty much um, bringing in other speakers from you know, universities, other organizations, to, to talk about these sorts of issues. So maybe it'd be, a, be a, sec, a session on free speech, or maybe on on the American founding, or maybe on uh, African American political thought, or maybe on rights, so those, those sorts oh, of problems. Oh, see, I thought it was more like psychological and dealing with stress and things of that sort. No, but no, I would say something like that Center for Human Resiliency that I mentioned, which is the psychology department. Maybe they need something like that. Maybe they need something. What, what, what department did you think I was talking about? That's more, so that is psychology? It, well, I think that it's housed in psychology department. I'm pretty sure. But this is not, all I am, I'm only here as a political science center for such an individual. I was just trying to say there are already different centers. You okay. can look them up. I think that one's called Lyda Hill, so L-Y-D-A Hill. And I think that it's run through the psychology department. Almost all the centers are going to be tied to certain departments. Because they kind of need to have a home, you know, a home base. Um, so yeah, that might be one to look at. All right, so that's really good guess. <laughs> I'm following the pro, so please forgive me for uh, having a more basic approach. Um, so first, I'll ball. Uh, somebody already introduced me, but. I'm Alexander Dowslich, and I am the um, Director of Outreach for UCCS's Center for the Study of Government and the Individual. And um, I'm honored to be here today to talk to you guys about some of the basics of local government, as well as kind of voting from a very kind of nuts and bolts perspective. Um, so first of all, I'm going to be showing you guys kind of a funny clip, a little bit more lighthearted. Um, and this is from a real city council meeting. Uh, that take, that's taking place in San Clemente, California, which is a beach town. Um, and these concerned citizens, um, they've uh, proposed to their city council to, re to erect a statue of Paul Walker. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Paul Walker from The Fast and the Furious, but he's a, a movie star, basically, that's kind of been idolized. And they're talking to... Um, talking to the city council basically to make sure that this statue is big enough so it can ward off sharks. So um, please bear with me and uh, we'll watch this little clip, part of the clip. to you guys for that. I come to you today because unfortunately the division in our country has gotten worse since we last spoke. This division made me bummed, and I was worried I was going to stay bummed. But the little bit of stoke I had left in me made me watch the first drag race from the Fast and the Furious, and my stoke meter filled right back up. And that little bit of bummer was like, dude, I almost had you. And I was like, almost had me? You never had me. You never had your car. Thank you for your attempt at honoring Paul. 
I genuinely believe that using a statue to ward off the sharks is a worthwhile endeavor. But to be quite frankly, the statue you made is too small. Paul was a giant among men, and a one-foot statue is not gigantic enough to unify this nation. I still love you guys though, and sincerely there is no beef. But America loves size. The statue needs to be 12 feet tall so that it can ward off 12 times as many sharks. And perhaps more importantly, bring our country together times 12. With your permission, I'd like to unveil my perspective statue design. Thank you. <laughs> Are you donating that to the city of Yes, I am. Also, have another artist rendering. Ten. <laughs> so, are you suggesting with or without legs? <laughs> I think uh, with legs is preferable, and uh, maybe band shoes, I think, would be more converse. Um, but I think those are pretty stunning, and uh, from your reactions, I think you guys agree. Um, imagine if we had Paul on the pier. There's nothing that could make you enjoy your breakfast burrito more. Imagine you're someone immigrating to San Clemente, and the first thing you see upon your arrival is Paul on the pier. There is literally nothing that can make you feel more amped upon your arrival. Now, I'm pretty sure I just generated a ton of momentum, so I'm going to ask you guys, can we break ground before Thanksgiving? All right, we'll stop there. But um, So this is just a funny example of one of the roles of local government um, that citizens within a community um, gathered to discuss kind of these types of meetings, whether it's serious or funny, um, something that citizens can participate in and um, kind of bring grievances as well as kind of local issues. <coughs> There's um, land developers that can kind of come and talk. There's specific county grants. There's ordinances. So this is just one of the many types of um, issues that are discussed. Um, so what is local government? Kind of just from a basic nuts and bolts perspective. Um, local government is the level of government that is closest to the people and consists of a city council, sheriff, you've got your mayors, you've got your school boards, um, and all of those um, positions are bodies that keep up, that keep, city, that keep cities like Colorado Springs running smoothly. So that's kind of what consists of um, kind of what, what makes up local government. Um, you've got obviously your state love government and then you've got your federal government, which are bigger expanded. Um, they're not as specialized, but they kind of, um, are the majority of, um, they kind of encompass bigger, bigger types of issues. Um, so local government can go, uh, as specific as something like this clip, which is a particular little monument. Um, so these decisions made by local government uh, directly impact our lives, including things like school curriculum. We've got parks, we've got road maintenance, especially in Colorado Springs, we've got a lot of potholes. Um, we've got safety issues. And perhaps most importantly, um, we've got things like this, where we've got uh, city council meetings that are set up, or stakeholder meetings, where people can come in and they can talk about grievances or particular issues. Um, so how are these local positions filled? Does anybody know? how these types of positions are filled. <laughs> exactly, yeah, by, by elections and voting. Um, so since uh, we're a, obviously a debate of constitutional democracy, representative democracy, things like that, we, we typically vote for people uh, to make decisions on behalf of the communities that they represent. So in this particular example, the city council of, of San Clemente uh, is comprised of the city councilors as well as the mayor who represent those individuals within that community. And those particular individuals are voted in during an election. Um, some details regarding elections and voting. Um, voting elections is the main way to make your voice heard, as Professor Pitts um, 
very, <laughs> very uh, eloquently stated. Um, so some of the laws involving surrounding voting are as follows. Uh, number one is voters must be U.S. citizens. That's an important one. The second is voters must be at least 18 years of age. Uh, the third is that voters can only vote once in an election. And finally, voting is free and voluntary. So again, it's that question of is it important? Um, obviously, we, we do believe that it's important, but that's, that's voluntary and that it's free. Um, during an election year, local government uses ballots, uh, which is an official piece of paper. That's where you go to a particular voting station. You can also vote by mail. But these particular ballots are official documents or official pieces of paper issued by the Secretary of State. And that contains the list of all of the, all of the candidates, as well as particular um, issues that individuals can vote on. Um, so for an example, I mean, you've got obviously your candidates, your politicians that are running for election, but a particular ballot issue um, affecting actually city council and the city of Colorado Springs, that's an active, uh, an active question right now, is whether or not the city of Colorado Springs can retain a tax to refund, um, a, a tax refund, I, I apologize, and use the money to build a new police academy. So the city is asking, if voters can keep a refund of about $20 per person and use those those monies to contribute to a new police academy. So that's gonna be one of the ballot questions that's gonna be um, for people to vote on, whether or not they agree with that, whether or not they don't agree with that. So that's an example of a ballot issue. Um, I encourage all, all eligible students, all of you guys who are able to, to register to vote when you become of age um, in addition to voting, you can also be involved by becoming an active participant with local government by volunteering. And you can also register for internships and things like that. If you guys have any types of questions, I know Parents Challenge can always funnel those types of questions to us. We're happy to connect you guys with local representatives or institutions or nonprofits that are involved politically. Um, so that's always another opportunity to get a little bit more involved if you're not necessarily of age. So um, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved through volunteering and internships. And I encourage you guys to stay informed by just continuing to follow funny city council meetings because uh, you really do get uh, a colorful array of, of issues and people. Some of them, again, are very dry and kind of macro level questions. Some of them are land development use questions. And some of them are just really funny and local and um, a little bit more lighthearted. So you get a whole array again out of at the local government. And um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the gist of the basics of, of local government. And does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Sorry. Um, it just caught my attention because you said the rules for be, you know, being able to vote, one of them was to be an American citizen. Yeah. But that's not really being followed anymore as, you know, you can't identify the person, you, can, you know, it's like everybody goes in. So that kind of takes away from the pride of going to vote. Mm. Yeah, and, yeah, definitely. And, and some of those questions, again, are some of the, the really interesting things that we can talk about um, at upcoming meetings those for Parents Challenge. Those are things you would do as civil and like, ask for such things as like ID and things like that. Truly, yeah, and you can, and you can come to local city council meetings and they have something called public comment where there's particular items on the agenda where you can't necessarily go off topic, but there is a portion that is public comment. And you as a citizen have a right to come and talk about whatever issue you care about, anything that's pertinent either to the local government, federal or state. We can talk um, really at any level, which is, again, a wonderful process that's built in at the local level. So that could be certainly a question or an issue of grievance that you could bring up at a local level and this, the local government may say, okay, noted, thank you. Or they can say, we can connect you with the Secretary of State's office if that's something that you're concerned about. So um, just depending on your local government and how involved they are with the state government, that's definitely- Yeah, I'm just saying that because sometimes like, the motivation sure. is lost. So it's kind of like, it takes away from the- uh... But again, that's wonderful about being at the city council, you know, and being able to have that public comment because <laughs> It's noted and it's addressed and it's in it's in writing. So, thank you. Great. Any other questions or anything comments? 
Anybody want to watch the Paul Walker movies now? No? Okay, well, thank you so much, guys, and enjoy your campus tour. Thanks. Sir, did you need me? Yeah, did you need me to help you connect to the... Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, thank you, guys. That was very informative and excellent, and I think we all learned a lot. Um, we have a quiz for you guys, uh, but while we're setting that up, there is a QR code on your agenda. Please scan that now and take the evaluation for Dr. Pitts and Alexandria. Uh, Deborah, did you want to come up? Yeah. Okay. How many of you have been to a city council meeting? Okay. They can be very entertaining, uh, uh, but they can be very informative depending on what's on the agenda. I always say look to see what's on the agenda before you go, uh, because sometimes uh, they can be very long-winded. But I just want to talk about a couple other things. Just uh, thanks, Steve. Thanks, Alexandria, for uh, giving us information on what's happening at uh, UCCS and just keeping us aware. Um, November is our opportunity to vote, and if you're not registered to vote, please register to vote. Uh, those that may be considering UCCS, that partnership that we have uh, with the uh, CSGI uh, department allows our uh, incoming students to UCCS uh, to receive a scholarship of about $2,000 by participating in this program um, with uh, CSGI um, and they can receive that for four years if they participate in the program. Uh, so this is kind of an extension of Parents Challenge beyond K-12 uh, for those that um, choose to go to um, UCCS. And the whole C um, CSGI, um, Joe Woodford is a main part of that and he's one of our board members and really looking at how we can just make sure that uh, we continue to stay involved in government and understand all aspects of that as it relates to our lives and uh, this is an opportunity for good dialogue conversation they study books they get together for luncheons and have conversations and it's just really an opportunity to just <coughs> make sure students stay connected so, those of you uh, scholars that may be looking at UCCS, uh, that's an additional benefit of having been in the Parents Challenge. So, a couple other things. Uh, we have any seniors this year. Daniel's scholarship is out. <coughs> um, and it's from September 15th through October 15th. Uh, for any, anyone who's a senior this year to apply. Uh, it's an outstanding scholarship and really allows uh, individuals to uh, not only just receive a scholarship for going to school, but really to receive uh, leadership training and mentoring and all of those things that uh, will be helpful in college because once you get into that that space there are just so many things that you're not aware of it's great to say oh i get to be on my own and my parents aren't around and yada 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 and then wow okay that means that now i'm responsible for all of the decisions related to going to school and those scholarships so daniel's fund does a wonderful job uh, but September 15th to October 15th, we did have a scholar last year who received the Daniels uh, Fund Scholarship and is going to a school in California, received, will receive over $100,000 towards uh, the scholar, uh, college education. Uh, if any of you love going to the circus, it's this weekend, next weekend, sorry the Al Cayley Shrine Circus. So we just have some tickets here. I know it's admit, admit one child free with one paid adult. 
and it's going to be in Pueblo at the Honor Speedway or at the Doris Penrose Event Center uh, in Colorado Springs. So it's next Saturday and Sunday in Colorado Springs and next Friday in Pueblo. So the tickets are here. You can take as many as you like. And then um, students in your schools, you have a program called Safe to Tell. What's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of Safe to Tell? Anybody know? <laughs> you quit raising your hand. <laughs> yes. I can't hear you. Can be part of can be part of that. What else? Why would you use safe to tell? I want big kids. I want big kids to answer. Yeah, so it could be really it's an opportunity one to have anything that might be happening that where you might not feel safe or you might feel as though something's going on that you're not comfortable with that you can report it and you're not going to be identified so they're not going to say oh Deborah called in and said blah 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 was happening on campus this is an opportunity for you again to safe to tell so that if a situation is going on that you feel unsafe or a situation you're not just you're not sure about you're not comfortable with you can report it and know that then somebody's going to address it and it could be something as simple as i was in the bathroom and somebody just took the entire garbage can and emptied it all in the toilet stupid thing to do but somebody did it and I saw them do it and or I saw somebody who just uh, I don't know spilling something down the hallway that people are going to slip on or fall um, I think that an important thing too is to follow these to see their TikTok challenges oh. that carry felony and misdemeanor um, but when you hear about that and it's rigged and you know that it's happening in your school or your district or your neighborhood that's another really great way uh, because safety tell is specific in Colorado and so they really look at regional where you're at right so yeah a lot of a lot of TikTok challenges which are crazy uh, harmful uh, and uh, can be devastating um, are happening on campus so safe to tell for that but i also want to tell you about another organization called crime stoppers has anybody heard of crime stoppers mm -hmm. you see the commercials on tv you might see the billboards all around town uh, so crime stoppers is another organization uh, that is really looking at how can we have individuals to report crime that's happening in their communities uh, anonymously again this is an anonymous opportunity to do that um, and there are rewards for if a particular crime is they do catch the perpetrator or they they solve the situation uh, that you can actually receive a reward for doing that but again it is anonymous and so I uh, just want to make you aware of it I mean crime has increased significantly and some people are just doing really stupid stuff um, and the ability to try to help stop crime and to know you can report it and not again be identified. So October is actually Crime Prevention Month and they have an entire week dedicated to it. Um, for those of you that don't know, Crime Stopper has like this really cool old school dog in like a trench coat who looks like an investigator. Um, but also if you have any security concerns at your child's school, you can request what's called a um, tech through the CHPD department or the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. And what they'll do is it's crime prevention through environmental design. So they would be able to go and look at the school and look to see, are there too many access points? Does your school have a resource officer? Are there security um, concerns about you know where the bus stops are? 
to where the locations are, um, things like that. And so you can actually petition um, to your school administrators to request and have that. And they should have an emergency or security manager um, that manages those things. So that's another really great thing. Nice. And then they partner with the shoppers so that way there are things that are happening in school. And I know this organization, here's the number, 719-634-STOP. 719-634-STOP. I do have a couple of magnets here that you can take. One of the things that they have done is they have met with uh, many of the uh, SROs, the security resource officers at schools. Uh, they are meeting with all of the superintendents and heads of schools at charter schools and private schools for the purpose of getting this information out so that we can help stop, eliminate, reduce crime. So if you see it happening, 634-719-634, stop to help with that. All right, I'm done. Okay, do I just hit start, Deborah? Or do I have to assign? Yes. Just hit start. Mm -hmm. So everybody, I uh, need you to get log into your Kahoot. Bones. Log into Kahoot it, and you're gonna put this code, this game pin in, and just want to give you some knowledge about some laws some, and so forth. Yeah, some just some random questions. The person who comes in first place will get a gift card and then we'll do a drawing for the other two. Well, you could do one, two, and three. We could. Why don't we do that? Because it'll come up. Yeah, they'll be second, first, second, third. third. All right. So if you just scan the uh, QR code that's up there and then just put in the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I love these things. Mm -hmm. All right, well, you guys are not using your. Or just people want to go with it. <laughs> nope, so I started yet. No, nope, we only have eight people in and we have like 20 people here, so. <laughs> Got a phone, log in. This is one time we're going to tell you to take out your phone and use it. All right, who's still trying to get in? Okay, two more? Okay. All right, anyone else? One more? Is everybody in? All right, I'm going to start it. You guys ready? It, it, some of them are timed, some are longer than the other ones. Here we go. All right. All right, what branch of government includes the Supreme Court? Just hit the color that's on your phone. Pick, yeah, pick the answer that. All right. We got, most of you got it right. Good job. It is the judicial system or branch. All right, ask those in first place. Who's asking? All right. 
All right, true or false? There are four branches of the United States government. False, there are three branches. Yeah, good job, guys. All right, Team Meemeyer is taking the lead. All right, how many U.S. Senators are there? I had to look all these up, guys, so don't feel bad if you get them wrong. <laughs> What if you took civics like two decades ago? <laughs> <laughs> Not a good All right, so it is 100. There are two senators per state. <laughs> All right, Jamie Myers, old and strong. All right, who is the governor of Colorado? Roy <laughs> Romer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yay! You guys all got it right. That's that's very good. <laughs> all right, Ass is back in the lead. True or false? The president of the United States must be at least fifty years old to take office. False. How old must he be? Oh yeah, good job. <laughs> All right, good job, Asta. What living document is divided into the preamble, seven articles, and amendments? That means, what does that mean, a living document? Yes. Good job, guys. That means it can change. It can be amended. All right. All right, Asta. How old must you be to legally vote in the United States? And this was already told us earlier. Good job, 18. All right, Team Niemeyer, back in the lead. All right, this is a ranking one, double points. Rank the presidential order of succession if the president becomes incapacitated. Go in who would come next, after, and then go down. Which order? So who's first in line, who's next, then after that, and then after. Just press the colors. Press the colors in the order that you want them in. Get things. Okay, so none of you got this correct. That's okay. <laughs> It is the Vice President, then the Speaker of the House, and the President Pro Tempore of the Senate, then the Secretary of State. Really? I thought it was Secretary of State. Because when uh, they were always afraid that Newt Gingrich was going to be. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> so, like I said, what if we took civics like two, three decades ago? then you're not going to win this. <laughs> All right, true or false? Congress has the power to make new laws or change existing laws. That is true. Yes, that is Congress. 
and most of you got that right. And Asta is now back in first, and we have some new runners up. All right, where does the President of the United States work? Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Oval Office. Okay, we got a new one, Lulu. Who's Lulu? All right. All right, who is Congress made up of? People who want to take away our rights. <laughs> All right. All right, good. Most of you got it right. It's the House of Representatives and the Senators. All right, true or false, there are currently 435 voting members of the House of Representatives. All right, good job, guys. Uh, almost everyone got that right. That is true. <coughs> All right, Lulu. K is back with an answer streak of three. All right, what is a presumption of innocence? <laughs> so that is the principle that everyone accused of a crime is innocent until proven guilty. All right, Jazzer's coming up. <laughs> All right. What amendment guarantees us the right to a trial by an impartial jury of our peers? Can we sing the Bill of Rights song to help us remember? Sure, go for it. <laughs> it is the Sixth Amendment, and only three of you got that right. Good job. <laughs> All right, Ooh. staying strong. All right, here we go. Here's another puzzle. Double points. Rank the seriousness of a crime from which one is the least serious to which one is the most serious and you get the most punishment for. Can we read Dante's Inferno first? The least serious. Least to most. All right, we got four of you got it right, good. So you got an infraction, then you got a misdemeanor, and then you got your felony is your most serious crime, which none of you will ever commit. <laughs> oh, we got a new leader, Yesenia. Nice. All right, true or false, a 16-year-old can drive alone in Colorado. That is false. A 16-year-old must have someone over the age of 21 with him. Wow. Yeah, they still have to have someone. Wall breakers, I see all right. All right. True or false? It is legal to record a phone conversation without the consent of at least one party in Colorado. 
It is illegal to record it without their consent. Yes, this is false. You must have consent if you're going to record someone's phone conversation. So don't do it. All of you that said it's minor? true. Even if they're a minor? I, I'm pretty sure it's across the board. But you might want to, I don't know. All right, Yesenia, can you do it? All right, true or false? Puffing, warming up your car, is illegal in Colorado. Is there like a dance party around somewhere? That is true. You are not allowed to leave your keys in the car and warm it up in Colorado. And I do it all the time until I learned this when I did this. <laughs> You'll get like a $60 fine or something if you get caught. All right, Yesenia. We're almost there. We got two more. True or false, the stop and identify law requires you to show your ID to the police when pulled over for a traffic violation. All right. I almost ever got it right. It is true. That is what that law is called. All right, here we go. Yesenia. Yay. Holding the lead. Last one. True or false? Colorado does not permit regular cell phone use for voice calls or allow you to wear a headphone in one ear while driving. This is while driving doesn't allow you to use it for voice calls or let you have a headphone in your ear. It is false. You are allowed to use your phone for voice calls and put a headphone in your ear. You're not allowed to put input data into your phone while you're driving. Good job, guys. All right, here we go. Who's the winner? Da, 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 da. Lulu's in third. Jazzy's in second. Who's Jazzy? And first place is Yesenia. All right. Good job, guys. Those were hard. So. You forget how much you like, or like what you forget as you get older. Or we're lost There were cell phones when I was a kid. Yeah. So we Jazzy Lulu. Jazzy. 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 All right, guys, we are going to head over to the main campus. We have lunch, go on a tour. Um, Andreana's going to be leading that. So.